Welcome to Bods Mayhem Hour. Your source for all hard rock, heavy metal, new metal, alternative, punk, horror punk, hardcore, rock, and all local bands with your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. The Bodfather. Hey everybody, welcome to Bods Mayhem Hour. I am your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. The Bodfather. I am bringing you guys, as always, a freaking awesome interview. I have Dave Brokey, none other than Odorous. Urungus, the lead singer of Aguar. Dave, man, what's going on? That's Brocky. Brocky, I'm Brocky. sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing. Yeah, I actually like Brokey better because like, it implies that I break things all the time, which I do. <laughs> like, for instance, the other night, my nose. I was at a bar um, watching the playoffs, which blew because all of my teams got beaten. And uh, I was there, like, all day. And so what did I do? I was drunk, of course, and I decided to do the responsible thing and uh, called a cab. And a friend walked me to the cab, opened the door to the cab. I turned around, and he opened the door of the cab directly into my nose. Oh, no. Splitting it. Yeah, splitting it wide open. They got me home, and I was still, I was so drunk, I didn't really know what was going on. I think I had a concussion. And I was convinced that this blob of blood and dried stuff on the end of my nose was like part of like a burrito or something that I'd been eating. So I grabbed it and was like trying to pull it off. And all I did, of course, was grab a flap of skin and succeed in ripping my nose open even more. So, uh, yeah, I'm a breaker of things, especially myself. Speaking of the playoffs, yeah, you know, football – for me this year pretty much sucked because my Steelers was out of it in like in three games. So, I mean, you know, and you're, you're a Redskins fan. So what about RG three? What do you think the skins have to do to get them in the playoffs? Well, you know, first of all, I would change that ridiculous freaking name. I know this is not a, a popular opinion. I grew up in the DC area and I never liked the name. Um, I always found it offensive. And, you know, if, if you think Redskins is a cool thing to call some, a team, well, I would just ask you, well, do you think our country would tolerate the yellow skins or yeah. the brown skins right. or any other color skins? How come it's cool to name a team the Redskins? You know, everybody else in collegiate football, in professional sports, like, that, they're the last bastion of this very, very racially wrong term. It's just not right. Yeah. You know, and, and the first thing that Dan Snyder will do is he'll say, oh, we have the support of the Native American community. Well, that's BS. I just came back from a coast-to-coast Guatemala. Everywhere we went, when I saw Native Americans, I went up to them, engaged them in conversation, introduced myself, and then after I established the poor, asked them what they thought about the name, and they all agreed 100%. It's a ridiculously offensive name. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that Dan Snyder has to do is just get rid of that freaking name. You know, it's just got to go. You got the president saying it's got to go. Well, you know, a lot of people say the president has got to go as well. I just happen to think that it's, it's just like, if you change that name, Everybody hates Dan Snyder. He's the biggest douchebag owner in the league. It's, and this is an opportunity for him to remake his public image. Instead of clinging to the vestiges of the past when terms like that were acceptable, and they are not acceptable anymore. And I don't care about how many fans of Guar are going, oh no, Brocky's gone soft. He's gone all PC on us. Well, guess what? Being PC is sometimes cool. I don't give a damn about being PC. I give a damn about what I believe in. And I believe that is a racist term. I think if you change the name, you have a chance for Dan to remold himself as a progressive, forward thinker. It will completely change the culture around Redskin camp. And I think it could rebirth the team. I grew up when the Redskins were in the playoffs every year, when we ran, won three Super Bowls, when John Riggins ran over that Miami Dolphin dude, and I was in the streets of Georgetown riding 
enjoy. We were standing on top of a metro bus trying to knock it over. Now, that maybe wasn't too cool, but we were sure happy. And ever since then, it's just been nothing but torment. Yeah, I mean, so, you had Mark Rippon at the time, too. was and Mark Rippon was a great quarterback for you guys. And Art Monk, I mean, what a hell of a receiver he was. Oh, my God. The, the, what do they call him? The Fun Bunch or whatever? Yeah. Gary Clark. Yeah. Gary Clark, Albert Collins, uh, and, of course, the, the the amazing Art Monk. Yeah, I mean, I, I was a kid then, and uh, that's what I grew up on. What? I remember, I mean, I was, <laughs> I'm so old. I remember when the Redskins symbol was just a big R on their helmet. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the thing is, the Skins have got a tradition of being a losing team. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're one of the oldest franchises in the league. Um, not a lot of people know this. They also have a tradition of being a racist team. They were actually ordered by the government to hire black players. They were the last team that had colored players on the team, and they were forced to do it by law. So, I mean, it's just like, and the fact that it's also our nation's capital, land of the free, home of the brave, that we have such a terrible name for the team, for the most famous team from, the, from, uh, from Washington, D.C., I just think it creates a lot of negative energy. And uh, I think if they got rid of it, you know, I mean, I read the Washington Post every day. You know, I got a Kindle, and it gets delivered to my Kindle, and no matter where I am in the world, I read the Post every day, and I read it because I'm a skin stan. And it's just like, you know, all the writers on the Post are just like, they don't even want to write the word Redskins. They'll call them the skins, or they'll call them the team, or whatever. It's just like, it's so obvious. I mean, the NAACP just came out against it. It's like, yeah. so many people, are, it's going to have, have to happen sooner or later. All the high school teams have gotten rid of that name. All the collegiate teams have gotten rid of that name. And then they, they have the capital of our country, which is supposed to be the, the, the land of freedom for all types of people, and they won't change it. Yeah. And that, that, to me, I think that would be a huge thing to do, and I think the team could remake itself as a winner. Now, as far as just, you know, the players, you know, I, I happen to believe it doesn't really matter what players you have. It matters how they're coached. It all starts at the top. And at the top of the organization is the owner. And when the owner shows that he's got a heart, that he's got uh, sensitivity, then that will trickle down and it will help everything. I think yep. Jay, Gr- uh, Jay Gruden, I think he's a great choice. Yeah. I never liked Shanahan. Never liked Shanahan. He came in there to Bronco country after Dan Reeves, Reeves had already set everything yeah, up for him. Exactly. And so I never liked Shanahan. And, you know, and, you know once the, the Redskins just became an absolute debacle, you know, I mean, we last year, not, not this season, but last season, you know, where, where RG was obviously injured, you know, and yeah. my house was full of Skins fans, and we were just screaming at the TV. Oh, my God, take him out of the game. Take him out of the game. And then his, his leg just broke in half. And then that whole, like, all in on day one, you know, it's, it was just horrible. It's just a debacle. You know, like you and, said, uh, it, like you said, it's yeah, like so, at, the, at the top of the main to, at the top of the main pole. You know, that's where it, it all starts from. Look at the Patriots. I hate the Patriots. I mean, I can't stand the Patriots. But my God, Bill Belichick can take some some dude that's been in a, a JUCO transfer from college and turn him into a superstar in the NFL. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people criticize Brady. A lot of people uh, criticize Belichick, especially. But I guarantee you, there's not a single football fan out there that would not take either one of those guys on their team. Yeah, well, I, I take Belichick. <laughs> I take Belichick. I don't care if I hate him or not. I just want the team to win. Yeah. Hopefully, Gruden. Hopefully, Gruden will come in there. Hopefully, RG will continue to rehab. Hopefully, RG will stop believing in his hype. And they'll get down to business, and uh, and maybe Dan Snyder will actually get a clue and uh, change that ridiculously offensive racist name. One more, football. and then maybe the maybe the maybe the team's got a chance at that point. Exactly, because like you said, it all starts at the top, man. 
It, it, and it does. Oh, he's, Snyder is such a jerk. I mean, you know, I read all these articles on, in the Post that are all, you know, you know, from employees inside Reds. I mean, the turnover rate at Redskin Park is just so amazing. Like, he hires basically a new staff every year because nobody can stand working for him. Yeah. Shanahan and, and Snyder hated each other completely. Even though Shanahan got everything he wanted, he still absolutely despised. Dan Snyder. And Dan said, oh, it'll be totally hands-off. I won't mess with the football team at all. But all of a sudden, RG3 has got a parking space in the stadium right next to the locker room door. And he's buddying around with Dan Snyder taking off on his private jet everywhere. And it was just like, you don't do that with your players, man. You, you don't put your players on a pedestal in front of the other players. You don't play favorites. Even with your best player, yep. you alienate your team if you do that. That is basic psychology. And, uh, you know, the man's an idiot. You know, he's a, he's a business genius. The Redskins are the second most valuable franchise in the league. But uh, Snyder, he's unscrupulous, unethical, and devious. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I don't think that he's going to change. And I think. For the rest of my life, I'm going to be cheering for a losing team. <laughs> hey, you know, I'm, I'm spoiled because I'm a Steelers fan. and, and Dick You LeBeau, are. You, you know, Dick, Dick LeBeau is not going to be around forever, and that defense for the past three years have, has went to just nothing. You know, with, yeah, with, with Troy I, Palomalu. I have hardly heard Troy's name at all this year. I mean, yeah. Yeah, when when Troy you know, Polamalu got can't hurt, do it all by himself, that's for sure. Yeah, when Tro- when Troy Polamalu got hurt, man, I mean that defense just really reeked, and now he's he's back healthy. But they just, I, I don't know. It's like finally the other teams have said, "Okay, look, we figured you out." <laughs> and they yeah. just they picked well, it's, them it's apart. It's a tough league. It's a tough league, and I've been writing that sports column for Metal Sucks now for three years, and I'll tell you, it's it's tough to write sports as well because. God, fans are so vehement in their opinions. And, you know, I, I probably lost a lot of Guar fans because of my opinions, you know. Like right after the, the Seattle game, uh, the last uh, game where they beat uh, the 49ers, yeah. you know, I wrote my column and I was like, you know what, I thought Richard Sherman was out of hand. I, I thought too. that was ridiculous. Me too. I thought that was just, that's everything about the NFL that I kind of hate. You know, I understand that we need a villain, but like, when I was a kid, the villain was like Mean Joe Green. You know, he still had some class. And to me, Rick, uh, Richard Sherman's outburst didn't have any class. And I'm sick of boorish, loudmouth jerk-offs who, who, whose single talent in life is running fast and catching a ball yelling at me. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> it's and football. so I said so in my column. And you just I got like hundreds of comments. You know, F you, Brocky, F Guar, <laughs> F this, F that. It's like, you know what? F you. Yeah. But it's football because the last time I played football, you take it out on the field. You know, just because, yeah, okay, he tipped the ball. He made a good play. And and his reaction after the, the whole incident when they won, first of all, him going over and, and you know, Saying c- congratulations to ca- to uh, Crabtree, I mean that that should have waited after the whole game was over with, you know that to me that was like just intense of spiking more, uh, you know, for Crabtree to come back at him. Yeah, so what if he said something to you on the field, Sherman? You know, yeah, it's it's football. That's what it's for. You trash talk on the football. Take your ball and go home. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it just, I mean, to me, it was unsportsmanlike. Uh, yeah. You know, a lot of people are like, you know, oh, he was just really, you know, excited. He just made a big play. I understand all that. But you know what? When you do stuff like that, that is your chance yeah. to show class. Yeah. That's not a chance to show what a, what a dumbass you are. Yep. You know, he had stepped up and, and, and showed some decorum. You know, I know a lot of people aren't, are not agreeing with what I'm saying right now, and that's fine, you know? I, it, we, we live in a free country. We're supposed to have separate opinions about stuff. 
Um, but, you know, to me, that would have been an opportunity to, to show class yep. rather than boorish ignorance. And uh, unfortunately, that's what our culture seems to be slipping more towards all the time. You know, when I watched that movie, Idiocracy, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, that it really scares the hell out of me. A lot of people think it's a comedy. To me, it's a documentary horror film of what the future is going to be like unless we start developing a nation of thinkers and unless we get some class going on out there. Because, yeah. you know, it's just like the gap between the rich and the poor is getting bigger and bigger. And, you know, I have this, you know, as far as like what my vision of the future is, I tried to portray it on the last record, you know, Battle Maximus. And it's a very disturbing vision of a world where there's basically two types of humans, the ones that can afford to be healthy and the, and the slave class. And, uh, you know, I totally see it going that way. And, you know, I've spent 30, almost 30 years now in Guar as an artist, you know, on my little soapbox here, you know, and I don't really know how much good it's done, you know, and I think a lot of people would be like, you're in Guar, you got your dick hanging out, you're pissing on people. <laughs> but, you know, it's always been with thought, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, I'm not sure exactly what thought it was, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's always been a, a, a revolt. It's always been an attack. It's always been very much more about punk rock and not the cheesy punk rock we have nowadays, which is crap. Oh, my God, yes. Um, it, yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, all you got to do to know that punk rock is, has been dead for 30 years is go to any show, any punk rock show, and see everybody there is wearing... GBH and exploited and you know t- uh, t-shirts of bands that were at their finest you know 30 years ago and I can understand kids wanting to get into punk rock and wanting to, to, to carry on the tradition of punk rock and you know I was lucky enough to be there when it was born you know and so you know that that was cool but it's just like it's become completely commercialized now and uh, I find myself going back more to metal, you know, than anything else. I think I think metal has stayed more pure for some reason. I don't know why that is. You know, once we got through the, uh, the I was considered, you know, more a more more of a punk rock band. We just kind of, I mean, we were a band, we're a band, we're a theatrical metal band with a punk rock attitude. I guess is the best way you can put it. Right. I got one more football question for you, or actually a statement, and then and then we'll get I'll on talk, into this. I'll talk for another twenty minutes on that one. Come on, give it to me. Oh, this is cool, man. I this this is what I like. This is awesome. Guar has been petitioned to play at the halftime show for the Super Bowl, but however, my friend James Thornsbury in North Carolina wanted to say this: instead of playing the halftime show. Let Guar play the whole freaking show. And here's my thing about it. And if a, if a, you know if there's a bad penalty like unsportsmanlike conduct, feed them to the meat grinder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's exactly what I would do. Um, Odorix was asked <clears throat> by the LA Times, you know, how he felt about it, and he responded, you know, we have no interest in playing the halftime show. If we wanted to, we would. We're Guar. Uh, we want to actually play the game. <laughs> well, we don't want to play uh, just one team. We actually want to play against every team and just send them against us wave after wave until the, the playing field is just a mashed, bloody, sodden ground of, of death and destruction. And after we've killed every single team in the league, um, we'll start on the cheerleaders, we'll, we'll destroy the coaching staffs, the owners, and then turn on the crowd. And uh, we'll still have a halftime show, of course, and it will still feature completely corporate crap like Beyonce and Jay-Z and Bruno Mars or whoever, Justin Bieber or whatever. And they will, instead of singing and dancing, they will beg for their lives (laughs) as they are fed feet first to our freaking meat grinder. Yeah, it would be great. Unfortunately, I do believe that... uh, Every single person in the entire world could sign that petition, and it wouldn't make a bit of difference. <laughs> there's no way. There's no way the NFL is getting near anything that we do. 
uh, for a lot of people don't know this, but Death Piggy was your first was your guys' first band, and then they made it to Guar. But you were into the DC hardcore scene. How much of an influence did that affect you as your music career? Oh, huge! I mean, my first like uh, I started out, you know, listening to heavy music when I was uh, really, really, really young. Um, you know, probably the first heavy act I was into was Hendrix. And then, you know, then it was Zeppelin and, and Sabbath. And, you know, I graduated high school in 81. I was already, by, by 79, I was already aware of the Sex Pistols and the Clash and, uh, and punk rock and uh, started making the journeys down into D.C., into the underworld, um, where the hardcore scene was just starting to, to come alive. And uh, I remember I went to go see the Ramones, I guess probably in like 1980, I was a junior in high school, and I was right up front, you know, right in front of Johnny Ramone, and it was like the greatest night of my life. Wow. And uh, one of the bands that opened for them was this band called the Slicky Boys, and they were kind of a Ramonesy kind of, not super heavy, they were, they were kind of heavy, but they were, you know, more of that Ramone style kind of uh, punk rock. And uh, then we saw that they were playing a show at some club in D.C. like a week later, and we went to that, and after the Slicky Boys, this band came out, and it was their first show. It was a band called Minor Threat. And uh, I was just completely blown away. I'd never seen slam dancing before. You know, I'd never seen skinheads. And overnight, I was just like, I went from being like, uh, you know, the Johnny Rotten type punk to like a DC hardcore dude. Even though... I was never into the straight edge philosophy. I was always more like, you know, live and let live, let people do what they want. I yeah. want to go to a party and have fun. And of course, I ran afoul of Ian McKay or Mackay or McGay or whatever his name is. I ran afoul of him and all his crew almost immediately and would routinely be beaten up by these dicks. But I kept going to those shows. And then finally, I ended up uh, going down to Richmond to go to school at, at BCU and go to art school. And um, that's where I got, I found a, a punk rock community that was much more welcoming to my sense of humor and my sensibility. And uh, that's when I started Death Piggy. And um, it was just a little three piece band. And, uh, you know, and we were basically making fun of hardcore. Even though hardcore had only been around a couple years, I already saw like the limitations of it. You know, it was just like, there was a lot of uh, clickishness about it. There was a lot of elitism about it. it. To me, it didn't seem all that different than the jocks that used to persecute me in freaking high school. You know, and so I went right after that. And the way I went after it was by making fun of them and by acting as retarded as possible and just doing stupid things like pouring a gallon of mayonnaise on my pants and then playing a set, you know. It was just like... You know, I just acted like a retard, basically, and I've been doing it ever since. And the way the Guar kind of started was, uh, you know, Death Diggy used to have some light theatrical elements that were kind of built into it, and um, we were practicing in this, like, old abandoned milk bottling facility, and uh, there was a guy down the hallway from us that had this place called the Slave Pit, and a, a brilliant brilliant man by the name of Hunter Jackson, who uh, unfortunately hasn't worked with us for many years because he, he moved out to L.A. to do some other stuff, but he had all these amazing costumes that he was making for a movie called Scum Dogs of the Universe, and I was like, Hunter, dude, you should let me, you should let Death Piggy borrow these costumes one night, and we'll do a silly band called <laughs> It wasn't even called Guar, it was actually called <laughs> And we would kind of, we would open up for Death Baby. And we would just, we wouldn't even play songs. We would just stand there with all this armor and just let the guitars feed back and just go, say really stupid things. And, and you can dig that stuff up on YouTube. It's hilarious. And, and kind of the, the turning point came, we did a show where, and I think by that point, we'd actually changed the name to Guar because we realized people were getting it, you know, getting interested in Guar, and we wanted to be able to sell t-shirts, and we're like, there's no way we can write G-W-A-R-G-H-G-L-G-H-R-R-G-L on every single t-shirt. So we, we, we 
shut it down to Guar, and, uh, you know, we came out there to do Guar, and there was like 500 people out there. It was like the biggest duck piggy show ever. So we did our little three Guar show songs, and then we ran off stage, we took off the costume, we came back as duck piggy, and there was nobody there. They all left. <laughs> and that was, uh, in the terms of uh, the dudes in Spinal Tap, uh, a bit too much fucking perspective. <laughs> and <laughs> so we were like, wow. At that moment, even though we knew Dead Piggy was dead, and we, we'd gone as far as we could with it, it provided us with a vehicle to, to invent Guar. And, uh, and that's kind of how it all started. But uh, yeah, the DC hardcore scene, it definitely inspired me with its, with its energy and its rebelliousness and its creativeness and, 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 the, and the style. I love the fashion of the, of the, you know, the combat boots and the, and the, and the skinheads and the, you know, but I did not like the elitist aspect of it. I never got along with the straight edge dudes and, you know, you know, I, I just never, never dealt well with jocks and I kind of saw them as just kind of, uh, jocks and punk rock clothing. How much did the mentors mean to Guar coming up? Huge, huge. El Duce was a good friend of mine. He was not at all like his onstage persona. He was like one of the first guys that really taught me, he's like, you can portray something else on stage and be completely opposite from that off stage. He was a, a very gentle man. He was a very, he was a funny guy. He was really smart. He was great, but he was a complete boozer. And the more he drank, the more he became the El Duce character. Yeah. But like all those, you know, rape rock and stuff like that, you know, that, that's ridiculous. He, he wasn't like that at all. We toured with him many times. And uh, actually, uh, there was one one time when uh, El, their, the mentors, uh, we were on, Guar was doing a bunch of shows with them on the East Coast, and we were rolling around in an old school bus. And uh, El, um, their, their, their van broke down. So they actually had to travel with us for like five shows. <laughs> Al used to do this thing to torture the other people in his band. He had one of those big medicine balls with a big rubber band on the end of it, you know? Yeah. And so you you punch it. And what he would do, he would, like, hawk up a big loogie onto the outside of his giant medicine ball, and he would punch it right into, the, like, somebody's face. Never <laughs> anybody in our band, but usually it was a sneaky sperm shooter, uh, one, of his, one of his guys. And, uh, you know, and we just thought that was hilarious. One day, though, we're, like, waiting for Al... He's always like, I need some sauce, you know, which means he needed alcohol. And, you know, he was a, he was a raging alcoholic. And um, he uh, freaking, um, we saw him in the parking lot coming back from the liquor store, and he was urinating all over this medicine ball. We're like, oh, no, he's going to do the spit loogie um, trick, but he's going to use urine this time, and we were not going to have that. But he got to the bus, and we were touring around an old school bus at the time, he got up the stairs and he was like gang tackled by every single person on the bus. And um, I don't know why one of my dudes did this, but I suddenly just saw an, uh, an arm go up in the air holding a switchblade. He flicked the fucking knife out and he stabbed the balloon and it exploded and urine <laughs> just went everywhere. Everyone was coated in LDJ's urine and it was completely disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he was a great guy, and uh, he was an amazing person. And uh, and I just, you know, I just don't. I think he saw the world for what it really was. You yeah. know, like just a hopeless death trap. And uh, and he was. I think he was all too glad to check out. I mean, I know guys that were with him when he died, and you know, his last gesture as he tried to cross those train tracks, um, he flipped off the train that ran him over. You know, he didn't try to get out of the way. He had a bottle, he had a, a bag full of 40s under one arm, and he saw he wasn't going to make it in time. And so he stood there and he flipped off that train and it ran his ass over. And wow. I think he was happy to go that way. Gee, that, that's, that's crazy, man. That's crazy. I know, it's crazy as hell. And it, it makes, you know, I, I still enjoy the hell out of my life. And I'm not ready to leave it anytime soon. Right. And, you know, I think... Uh, I think at his soul, L was a, a very sad person because, you know, there's just so much cruelty and horror, horror in this world and, and so much hypocrisy. 
and so much waste. You know, that's the thing that gets me. There's so much waste. There's no reason why every single person on this planet can't have a nice place to live, can't, you know, have enough to eat, have an education, and have an enjoyable life. There's absolutely no reason why, except, uh, like, 1% of the world's population controls 99% of the world's resource. And those are the motherfuckers that I have pledged my life to destroy. Now, with Guar, does everyone in the band contribute to writing the, the writing the songs, or is it just to you? How do you guys work this out? The last record, it was very much um, it was very much the band wrote the music, and uh, I wrote the lyrics, and I love that. I absolutely love that. And on some of the earlier Guar albums. My songwriting sensibilities tend to be more uh, uh, silly. Um, you know, songs like Death Biggie, songs like Sick of You, songs like Vlad the Impaler, um, a lot of those early classic Guar tracks. You know, I write kind of simpler songs. As Guar kind of grew, we had to grow as a band. And so we had to evolve and we had to become like a metal band, you know? And, and it's because it would just seem like a natural thing to do. You know, so I got guys in the band that, you know, that could do that. And really, it really started when Corey came along. Corey Smoot, bless his heart, and I miss him every day. And uh, he played Flatus Maximus. And he was, he was really the guy that kind of got us back on the, on the metal track, you know. Hello, our first record is kind of a punk rock album. Scum <laughs> Dogs and American Muscle Eaters Fight are getting more metal. And... We get into a whole, like, uh, I don't know. There's three or four albums that are just, like, very silly and all over the place. And then Corey comes along, and Guar completely becomes a metal band. Like, finally, with uh, 2001's Violence Has Arrived, Guar becomes a metal band for real. And at that point, I didn't have to write a lot of the music. I could concentrate on the concept. I could concentrate on my lyrics and I could concentrate on the vocal arrangements and my performance of those arrangements. And that's pretty much the way it's rolled ever since. Yeah, I've liked Meat Sandwich by you guys. I liked Sick of You. That's a badass song. And Road Behind is one of my favorite, all-time favorites by you guys. Well, yeah, those are all classics. There's a lot of, you know, I don't think Guar will ever really get its uh, props uh, for, for being musical geniuses or anything, you know. But I think I think the guys are. I really do. You know, I really think they've written a lot of brilliant music over the years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think we could be up there playing Tchaikovsky and, and, and uh, we still wouldn't get the credit we deserve because the, the visual is so stunning, so overwhelming that, uh, you know, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to, hard to keep up with it, you know, yeah. it's hard to keep up with it. For those who have not been to a Guar concert, what can they expect? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, they can expect uh, expect the most insane onslaught, uh, you know, of metal theater. That I mean, I don't really think there's ever been anything like Guar before. You know, the uh, the closest thing you could probably say would be, maybe be like Alice Cooper or something. You know, Slipknot and bands like Lordy, they, they, they're they sort of like Guar, but they, they don't take it as far. You know, we take, you know, we even Kiss, you know, it's, 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 it's way beyond Kiss because there's a comedy element to it. There's a, there's a very, uh, there's a political element to it. Um, there's also a very tactile element to it in that, we're spraying crap all over people, you know? <laughs> so, like, we're, we're getting people actually physically involved, you know, by squirting blood all over them, you know? And it's like, I think Guar is, you know, the revolution that is Guar, and the fact that uh, Guar is a, a very singular entity is kind of, uh, is uh, evinced by the fact that nobody has really outdone Guar. And a lot of that's because no one really wants to. <laughs> you know, like, I don't want to wear that 60-pound rubber costume and get soaking wet every night. But for some reason, we do. And, 
You know, it's just like, I would just, if you've never seen Guar before and you don't want to get covered in shit, you know, stay about 30 yards away from the stage. And uh, as far as, uh, you know, and just enjoy it. Come with a sense of humor, you know. It is, you know, it's, we're, we're dealing with a lot of heavy concepts, but we're, we're always trying to present them with a sense of humor. I've you seen... know, we're trying to draw attention to things by laughing at them. Yeah. We're trying to uh, defang things that scare people by literally dragging them out on stage and kicking the living shit out of them. That's and, awesome. uh, you know, really, at the end of the day, it is, and I'll, I'll, I'll quote directly from Pantera, it is a vulgar display of power. There is a real power to it, and uh, it does make you feel almost superhuman. It's it's quite insane. Yeah. And um, you know, and I just hope people and you know people have enjoyed it, and I think Guar has definitely secured its place in history. Oh yeah. And as an artist, as an artist, I was just like, when I was coming up, you know, I thought I was going to be a painter or an illustrator, and my biggest fear was like I would work my whole life on my art, and no one would ever would would, would ever care, because that's you know that's what happens to most artists but that didn't happen you know people do care and uh you know and we'll just have to see where it goes from here you, you know we, i've always said i've always said that guar is the band will last forever yeah and it's sad that you know we as fans know what guar is and what guar stands for and the loyal fans do but it's sad that it took 15 years to get kiss in the rock and roll hall of fame I mean, that's literally a joke. I mean, come on, 15 years, guys, if you can't get it right, they should be in the first year. But that's my opinion. In, in yeah, Gore, I, would, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Kiss was a revolutionary band. If there wasn't, if there hadn't been a Kiss, there never would have been a Guar. Yeah. You know? We took, we stole half of our stick from, from Kiss, and I'm the first person <laughs> to admit that. I mean, Kiss has Personally, had a huge influence. They, they kind of, I kind of got a little disenchanted with them when it just became so obvious that it was all about the money. You know, after after the third, this is our last tour tour, you know, I was just like, oh, come on, <laughs> you know, you know, it's like, if you're going to do if you're going to sell tickets on and this is the last time we're ever going to play kind of thing, then, you know, be true to your word. Not that I want any band to break up, but it's just, it's just such a commercial thing. And I've always, my punk rock roots have always made me rebel against that kind of stuff. Yeah. Or maybe, or maybe it's just jealousy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm always, I'm always getting pissed. I'm always like ragging on like Rob Zombie and like a lot of these acts that, uh, you know, are, are, are pseudo horror rock or whatever they are. It's just because it doesn't really have any balls to me. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have any freaking balls. And it seems to be more about making money than having balls. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I got, I got some balls over here. Um, Guar has got some balls. In fact, Odorous has got three of them. Three <laughs> big-ass balls. And, um, but, yeah, we never really made any money off this thing. We make enough to, to survive, but, but fucking nobody owns a big fancy house. We don't drive, I'm driving around in the same old fucking pickup truck I've had for the last five years. You know? and it's like, but it's all about bringing I, I, music I, I, to the fans, though. I'm actually doing this interview from my pickup truck parked in a Circle K parking lot, drinking a beer. <laughs> That's my rock star lifestyle. <laughs> but but it's all about bringing music to the loyal fans of you guys, though. Well, we love them. We do. And we know people get it. We know that we're... I've always felt it was the role of the artist, role of the musician, to, uh, to kick evolution in the ass. You know, I think the only way that the human race is ever going to get over the problems that beset us you know, the, the the vast disparity between the rich and the poor, you know, the continuing use of war as a way to settle our problems, the, the hypocrisy of religion. Um, the only way that we're going to get past these problems is, is through evolution. I mean, we've gotten this far from freaking monkeys, you know, throwing shit at each other, from yeah. freaking <laughs> trilobites, you know. We've evolved from, like, weird creatures crawling around in the slime to the point that we're here, you know, right now. And in another three million years, who knows what we'll be. Yeah. You know, we might be made out of vapor at this point or something, you know? Big floating brains. But uh, it, I've always felt it was, like, the artist, it was their job to help up evolution by holding up a mirror to society and, and uh, 
and seeing what kind of reflection we get back and uh, and distorting that in a way that would help people accept new thought. And uh, that's what Guar does, and that's what Guar has done. And a freaking, you know, comet could hit the tour bus and uh, we could be wiped out like that, and I would I would die a happy man because, you know, it's just like I know we did our job. And now the question is, you know, how much further can we take it? Yeah. Now, do you guys prefer clubs or festivals, or does it even really matter? I like clubs because, you know, we headline clubs. You yeah. know, and it's, it's all about the guar. Festivals are fun, too, but it's like the... the you know, usually, sometimes we play in the daytime. I don't like playing in the daytime. I think Guar is a nighttime band. It's it's difficult to, uh, you know, cram the whole Guar show into, like, a 20-minute set, you know. It just depends on the festival sometimes, you know. I, I like doing festivals, but, like, give me a hot, sweaty club with a thousand, you know. You know like when you play a festival, you might be playing in front of 50,000 people. And maybe 500 of them up front are really hardcore war fans. When you play at club, you're going to be playing for a thousand hardcore war fans. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe 800 war fans, and then 200 of their friends that have never seen war before. And that vibe is super intense. And uh, yeah, so I prefer, I definitely prefer club shows. What did it mean to you, man, the first time as o Odorous on stage hearing the fans singing your guys' music? I don't know. I mean. You don't really hear all that much except the band. You can't the, you, yeah. between songs you can hear them yelling. I think, I think really, maybe the first time it really stuck with me um, was the first time I really started like we'd be in the dressing room, and we could hear the crowd chanting "Gua, Gua, Gua, yeah. Gua," <laughs> and that that was like a, a bone chilling experience. It was like wow, we really fucking are onto something here. You know, we got a thousand maniacs out there and, uh, you know, and, and they're screaming our name and, uh, we must be, we must be, we must be touching them at some level. There must be, that sounded vaguely obscene. <laughs> we must be reaching them at some level, you know, it must mean something to them for them to, to put themselves in that position. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, the crowd is just a bigger part of the show at a Guar show. The only crowd, the only Crazier crowds I've seen are Slayer crowds. You know, I've been to plenty, plenty of Slayer shows, and I've, they're the only other band that I've ever really seen the crowd like just go off that much for. Oh, my God, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just saw Slayer a couple months ago, and even without, even without, without uh, Jeff, and it's just, it would have been Jeff's 50th birthday today, by the yes, way. Yes, it would. Yes, With, I was going to mention that to you, yeah. Yeah, uh, he was a genius, and uh, it's just such a, a shame what happened but i'll tell you you know a lot of people out there who think that uh, the rock and roll lifestyle is is an easy one you know it's no, not it's, not. it's uh, probably about the hardest gig you can have you know it's like sure there's a lot of glory and there's a lot of fun but like that stuff will wear you down and uh you know and there's a lot of casualties a lot of casualties a lot of people a lot of talented amazing people that left this world way too early yeah, and uh, you know, a lot of times it's not for things that are directly relatable to what happened to them in their bands, but you know, it pretty much was. You know, it's a it's a it's a tough road. You know, it's just like uh, like NFL athletes. You know, you know, sure it must be great to be in the NFL, but like, how great can it be to get your body just punished like that over and over? You know, to have to live in a one floor house because you can't climb the stairs by the time you're 40. I mean, yeah. for everything that you get, you have to give. And uh, I'll tell you, nobody gives more than entertainers and athletes. I mean, we give it all every night. And sooner or later, you don't have anything left to, to give. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then you die. <laughs> I just got a, I just got a couple more questions here for you, and I, I do appreciate you taking all your time out to do this, man, because this means the world to me. Bringing you know people, uh, musicians and bands to to the listeners out there, out there who listen to Bods Mayhem, I, it, it really floors me. You guys are so so down to earth, and uh, just thank you for that, man. Hey, no problem. I really I really appreciate it, man. It's great. It, it makes it worth honestly. It makes it worthwhile for me, you know. Yeah. Like. Not, we're here in Richmond, you know, we're off the road right now, and it's like, 
you know, it's like I do an interview and it reminds me, yeah, there's people out there that really do get it and yeah. it's very important to them. And it, and, and, it, and it restokes my passion and what I do. Yeah, and, and I get it. I absolutely live and breathe music. I mean, how can you not? How can you not have music in your life? I just don't see how you can. I'll tell you how you can. not If you do like Spotify and all of a sudden your <laughs> iPhone screws up for some reason, and like overnight your entire Spotify disc collection is ruined, it's like I'm so I'm so screwed up. It's like I spent like five years, you know, scanning every CD I had into my computer, and then one day it decided to erase every CD I had. Oh no! <laughs> I know. Oh, and then no. you know, so I was like, you know what? I'm not doing that again. I'm gonna go to Spotify and yeah. start building up my collection again that way. And then it, it did the same thing just the other day. Just crashed my entire collection. I'm just like, God, they're making it hard to be a music fan. But, you know, music is the single biggest driving force in my life. You know, it's, when I wake up in the morning, I play music, you yeah. know. I, I walk around all day. I listen to music all day. I listen, yeah. uh, When I get ready for a show, I listen to music. When I'm coming down from a show, I listen to more music. And, you know, it's, 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 the, it's the beat of my life. Yeah. What do you think the future of metal music holds for the new bands that are out there right now? Do you think that there are bands out there that are fresh enough that can make it as far as their music? What, what's your opinion? I think it's harder than ever for metal bands to, to be original because, um, you know, there's been so many great metal bands and, uh, and it's, there's just only so many ways to uh, float your boat, you know? It's like, We've had like every style of metal imaginable, but still, there's bands that uh, excuse me, I told you I was thinking of beer. Um, <laughs> there's still bands that every now and then that come out that really grab me. You know, I really and a lot of times these are bands that have been away for a while. Like I really dug the new Carcass album. You know, they, had, they hadn't done anything for years, but I really loved that album a lot. So it's but it's getting harder and harder and harder. For, for bands, you know, it's like punk rock was especially susceptible to that. I mean, how many how many different ways are there to write a punk rock song? True. Not really all that many different ways. It's very difficult. You know, it's like how many ways can you rearrange four chords? You know, not that every punk rock song, you know, has four chords, but it's just like sooner or later, any artistic movement becomes derivative of ones that came before it. So it's, it's, it's harder than ever. You got to be really good. You got to be really original and you got to practice your ass off. And, uh, yeah. And, you know, so it's like, I don't, I think it's a lot harder for metal bands to make it nowadays than it, than it ever was before. What they do have going for them though, is the fact that the ground has been broken. There will always be a demand for metal. And, um, you know, even if it sounds like the bands that were around 20 years ago, people are still going to dig it. You know, they'll, they'll never be another Slayer. They'll never be another uh, Kill 'Em All. You know, no, they'll never be no. another first Black Sabbath album. Yeah. You know, I thought you the know? new Black Sabbath. They'll never be another ass. Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath. You know, but but there will be bands that that sound similar, and uh, you know. I can't say I really dig bands like Avenged Sevenfold or Asking Alexandria or any of these like kind of new metal bands or whatever. I dug Whitechapel. We were just out with them. They're definitely doing something new. So it still can happen. I just think it's harder than ever. Your guys' new album is called Battle Maximus. It's out now. What are some of your favorite songs to play off of it live? Oh, geez. Um, we only play, you know... That's a, it's a lot of really hard songs on an album to play. You know, and the ones that I really want to play live, we haven't played live yet. Like, I'd like to play Fly Now really bad because that's kind of our, our flattest tribute song. Uh, but for some reason, I think it's like, would be very emotional for people to, for us to play that song. And so we kind of shied away from it. Maybe we'll bring that in on the next tour. Um, Madness at the Core of Time is a great song to play. It's just, you know, when Brent came into the band, Brent from Cannabis Corpse, and he was uh, took the character of Pustulus, you know, and that was like the first song, that was the first song that we wrote for the new album. And uh, it, he just did an amazing, 
and he just like came in and said like, this is this is my job and this is a, my first song for your new album and uh let's do it and he threw it down and it, it's freaking amazing That's and awesome. i love playing that song we play it first and it's the, it's just like a a bull coming out of a freaking you know rodeo pen or something it's just like a it's like it's like a thrash metal song and, and a punk rock song it's just like a that song is like a, a musical stampede, and it just takes people's heads off. I love playing that song. I, I like playing any song. I probably I have to say though, my favorite song to play on that whole album is the uh, the title track, Battle Maximus, because it doesn't have any vocals. <laughs> <laughs> All I have to do is fight a giant rubber monster in that song, so <laughs> I can catch it, catch my breath. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's awesome. <laughs> Hey, now, <laughs> at a Guar show, have you ever had any fan come up and, and tell Odorous, you know, hey, your music has helped me through tough times, things like that? What does that mean to you? Oh, it means everything. I mean, it means everything. It's more valuable than, than anything, you know? Mm -hmm. I've had it happen a lot. And uh, I always try to try to give the fans time after the show and come hang out with them and sign their stuff. And, and, uh, you know, nothing's helped me through tough times more than music has. And, uh, you know, when someone tells me that, that our music has reached them and helped them through a tough time in their lives, it's inspired them to do something, you know, good with their lives, then absolutely, that's, that's the biggest payoff that you can get as an artist. Yeah. You know, it's not about the money. It's not about the partying. It's not about the pussy. It's not about the power. It's about inspiring other people to do things like you have done and, uh, and maybe make this uh, big, sad mess of a world that we all have to share together a little bit of a better place. See, I totally agree with you 100%. It's the same way with this show. I don't get paid for it. I take time out of my own uh, day to do this, but it's something I love to hopefully make a difference and bring a new band to somebody that hopefully helps them or they turn to a fan or something, you know? Yeah, well, I think that's great, and it's wonderful that uh, that you do that. And uh, you know, it's uh, yeah, we're all on the same side here. Yeah. And uh, you know, for all for all those people that are you know trying to get everyone to fight each other, it's just like you know, we just need to remember there's this one thing, one common thread that the whole human race has with each other is that we all we all love music, you know. Exactly. And uh, you know, if we would if we would play a lot more music, and you know drop a lot less bombs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we might have a better might have a better world to live in. <laughs> I mean I was just reading today, this made me so sick. You know, this war in Afghanistan that we're still fighting. Um yeah. granted, sure, those guys that fucking took out the towers, yeah, they had to be taken out too. And I can see that, but it became way more politicized than it should. And you know, we've had people over there for twelve years now. It's the longest war that we've ever fought. And, uh, you know, I just re was reading this article today. It's like one of the first things we did when we went there is that we started uh, to help the Afghans. We built a whole road network for them. We actually built more than 10,000 miles of paved highways. And now that we're leaving the country, um, those people have no idea how to maintain them. And uh, they're all falling apart. And the Taliban is just blowing them up one after another. The Taliban, they're just like laughing. They're just waiting for us to leave. And actually, in this article I was reading, more people are being killed in traffic accidents on the roads we built than actually died in the war. <laughs> wow. Now, if that isn't an indication that something is seriously fucked, I don't know what is. That's kind of an epic fail, you know? <laughs> That's an epic fail. Jeez. That is a fucking epic fail. You know, and it's like I have all the respect for our service people, you know, yeah. and all the love for them. You know, and it's just like kind of my revolutionary message is, you know, we got to flip those guys and they have to see, you know, that their masters do not have their best interests at heart. And, uh, yeah, we need to take those fuckers in Washington and we need to just lock them into Congress and turn Congress into a prison, you know, and, uh, I really do believe that a popular revolution in this country, you know, a nonviolent one, could be the greatest thing in the world. And 
and I think uh, and I think music could be a huge part of that. And uh, I will always be a rebel, and I will be till the day I die. Speaking of of touring and stuff, you guys are kicking back off February the twenty second in Brisbane, Australia, and and this is something that a lot of people really don't didn't know this, but your guy you guys are playing Tokyo, Japan for the first time March the eighth. I know, isn't that crazy? Yeah, yeah. It took, it took thirty years for us to get there, but uh, we finally made it, and uh, I think it's going to be huge. You know, in fact, I got an interview right after this one. Uh, uh, with some crazy guy from Japan. I think those people are just going to freak out. I mean, I hear that the Japanese are very clean people, so I'm really wondering uh, what they're going to do when they get shit all over them from head to toe. So <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be a highlight of my life, and, uh, and uh, who knows? You know, KISS, it wasn't until they went to Japan that they really got huge. So maybe this could be like a, a big turning point for Guar. Man. And... Uh, it, and I've always said Guar will last forever. You know, one of these days I'll be too old to rock the rubber suit and, you know, Son of Odorous will have to take over. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe in a hundred years Guar really will rule the world. Dave, this has been an awesome, and I mean an awesome interview. I've done many interviews, but this this has really set the bar high. And I want to say just thank you for taking time out to do this. You know, two two music fans here talking to each other. I definitely love the music from Guar. It is something that uh, you know, could really help people out. It's, it's great stuff. If if you have a chance, guys, go watch Gore. Please go watch them. It'll be an awesome time for you. Before I let you go, is there? how can people reach out to you guys and say, we love your music, buy your merch? How can they do that? Well, they can go to www.guar.net. They can go to Twitter at The Real Odorous and follow me on there. Hell, they can even write me an email at maggotmaster13 at gmail.com. And uh, you can always get uh, get in touch with us through Metal Blade as well, who have been our uh, our label forever. Uh, bless them. Love Metal Blade. My favorite label ever. They've always been our home. And uh, But yeah, start your search. On also, uh, there's also a Guar Facebook page, of course, that I personally uh, I personally manage. So, um, you know, if you don't get through this at first, you know, keep trying. I do my best to reply to everybody. So, yeah, Facebook, the Internet, all that crap. And before I let you go, would you please do the honor of, of doing me a promo in Odorous' uh, character? No problem. Hey, human scum, this is Odorous from Guar, and you are listening to Bod Mayhem Hour. <laughs> Love it, man. Awesome. Hey, everybody, stick around. we got some guar coming up. And uh, I tell you what, you only hear these interviews right here on Bod's Mayhem Hour and Uber City Radio.